The other kids could make the books talk. They'd pick the books up and words would come out. He said, to me, it just looked like lines and circles and squiggles. I had no idea where the words were. The teacher began hassling me because I wasn't be, uh, be able to read. And by the end of October, the kids were making fun of me because I couldn't read. And I realized it wasn't going to be too long before my mom and dad found out that I wasn't doing my job. He said, so I was scared. I was really scared. He said, but I was also a real resourceful kid. And I looked around the room and I noticed there was another kid in the class who couldn't read. This kid couldn't read a lick. And yet nobody made fun of him because he couldn't read. And the teacher didn't hassle him because he couldn't read because he was deaf. He wore a hearing aid. He, he had a hearing loss. And because he was deaf, no one expected him to read on time. He said, so I figured in my six-year-old mind, the solution to my problem was to convince everyone that I was deaf. And if I could convince everyone I was deaf, they'd stop hassling me about the reading. He said, so I went on a one-man campaign to convince everyone in my life that I couldn't hear. He said, and everything was fine until June. I said, well, what happened in June, Dan? He said, my mom and dad sat me down um, the last day of school in June in the first grade and said, Dan, we're really worried about your hearing. You don't seem to be able to hear. We've taken you to hearing doctors and audiolo audiologists all over Cape Cod. Nobody can figure out what it is. So we've made an appointment for you. And you're going to go to Boston Children's Hospital next week. And you're going to stay there for four days and three nights. And they're going to do exploratory ear surgery and have your adenoids surgically removed. And this six-year-old kid went through three days of surgery rather than tell his parents what he had done. Um, can you imagine the trauma of a six-year-old child going through surgery that only he knows he didn't, he didn't, uh, he didn't need? The National Center for Learning Disabilities, we have a wonderful board of directors. We have uh, at least two individuals on that board, uh, both of whom have dyslexia, and both of whom are former governors. Extraordinarily accomplished individuals, both of them dyslexic. And both have talked at length about the continuing sense, not just of frustration or, or it's not just memories of failure, but precisely a sense of shame that is still remembered, classroom-based, other children around, a teacher, not being able to do what other children seem to be able to do so easily. It stays for a lifetime. She would go to the grocery and she would get the wrong thing. She'd just think, well, that's what I deserve. That's what I was supposed to get, you know. I'm, I, she just had no self-worth because it had been just shamed out of her because she couldn't crack the code. She couldn't learn. She couldn't do what everybody else was doing. The pain and the shame that people feel. People talking about walking back in the school and actually getting sick at their stomach, you know, because they remember how painful it was and how hurtful it was. Shame and avoiding embarrassment are at the heart of almost every story we get from adults who come into adult literacy programs. It runs the gamut from the mother who received notes, uh, receives notes from her children's teacher but tosses them in the waste can because she doesn't want to admit to her children that she can't read the notes that are coming from the teacher. Uh, the truck driver who goes to a colleague and says, I can't read Joe's writing. Can you tell me what this note says? Uh, the person who never, ans never fills out a questionnaire at work but says, well, uh, I didn't have my glasses today. I need to take this home and takes it home and has his wife read it to them and then comes back with the filled out form the next day to work. These stories recur over and over and over.